So good evening, everyone. Um, it's 7 p.m. on June 8th, 2017. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar. And tonight, I'm going to be talking about vegetable gardening in Northern Ontario and other cold climates with short growing seasons, <clears throat> which could be across anywhere. <laughs> Uh, this webinar is co-hosted by the Cochrane District Master Gardeners and the Durham Master Gardeners and has been adapted from a workshop given by the Durham Master Gardeners called An Introduction to Vegetable Gardening. My name is Pam Delaire and I am the coordinator of the Cochrane District Master Gardeners, which co covers northeastern Ontario east from the Quebec border, west to beyond Hearst, and north of Sudbury and North Bay to the far north in Kasechewan and Moosonee. As for myself, I love to grow my vegetables and I have two fairly large greenhouses in my backyard, which allow me to garden without worrying about frosty nights. So I'm lucky in that regard. I also have a vegetable garden in a swampy area where I grow, grow squash of all types. And it's my own personal challenge to grow bigger squash every year. Oops, sorry about that. With me today is Ingrid Jensen from the Durham Master Gardeners. Ingrid, can you introduce yourself and tell us what experience you've had with your vegetable garden? Okay, so I am uh, Ingrid Jansen. I am the co-coordinator of the Durham Master Gardeners. Durham is here in uh, relatively balmy southern Ontario. Uh, and Durham is a region that runs um, from just east of the city of Toronto, from uh, Pickering Ajax all the way to the east to the town of uh, Newcastle and north to uh, Cannington and uh, includes Uxbridge and other outlying areas. So it's a fairly large region. I am, uh, I have been a passionate vegetable gardener for uh, quite a few years. Of course, you know, trying to grow the perfect tomato is always the quest of, of most uh, home gardeners. I don't have the luxury of a greenhouse yet. It's on my list of things that I'd like to have. So that's a future project for me. But I have a, a large vegetable garden. I grow my own asparagus. So I have a big asparagus bed, all grown from seed. And I grow, um, last year I planted about 600 bulbs of garlic. So I'm looking forward to a really great garlic harvest. And of course, I do um, grow other vegetables as well. So that's kind of uh, my experience with vegetable gardening. It sounds like you're going to have a garlic festival <laughs> with all those bugs. So. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for volunteering your time today with this webinar, and we're lucky to have you. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Always love to talk to people about gardening. Yes, so do I. And for you viewers watching live tonight, I'd like you to I'd like to invite you to ask us some questions. So go ahead and join the chat room. URL or the internet address is posted above the presentation window that you're watching. And if you open a new page on your browser and type in the address shown above, it will connect you with a chat page where you'll be able to see all the questions asked during the webinar. And we'll try and answer as many as possible during our time tonight. Um, but make sure you keep this YouTube page open while you open the extra chat room so you don't lose our live presentation. And after the webinar is over, it will be uploaded to YouTube on the same link for later viewing by anyone. So don't worry if you are interrupted and have to leave the live show. And tonight we're going to cover these next topics. What is a vegetable and why should we grow our own? Where and how to grow vegetables? 
are cool and warm season crops. That gets confusing sometimes. And we'll discuss gardening in small spaces. Due to soils and composting. And finally, how to start plants from seeds. Daunting subjects. So to begin, we'll ask, what is a vegetable? A vegetable is defined as the edible part of a herbaceous plant. The edible portion of the plants include the roots and carrots, beets, onions, and potatoes. In asparagus and celery, the leaf in lettuce and cabbage, spinach, kale, and Swiss chard, the flower, cauliflower, and artichoke, which is sometimes confusing for people because they don't realize that's the flower, mm -hmm. the fruit in cucumber, eggplant, squash, and tomatoes, and yes, tomatoes are a fruit. It's when we eat peas, corn, or lima beans. Do you have any way to explain that in more detail, Ingrid? <laughs> well, okay, so we need to distinguish, and I always say to people, you know, what, what the grocery store does and what botanically the way things are divided. So a fruit, in botanic terms, is anything that contains seeds in it. So, however, because tomatoes are not sweet like strawberries, oh, sorry, However, because tomatoes are not sweet like strawberries, they're savory, we classify them in with vegetables in the vegetable store. But technically, it's actually a fruit. So is a squash, so is a cucumber. But because we eat them as in savory dishes and the way they are put out in the grocery store, we consider them vegetables. So I could say my pumpkin pie is a fruit pie. <laughs> Technically, you'd be correct. Exactly. <laughs> it is a fruit pie because you're making it from a fruit. But we class And it's sweet. And it's sweet. Exactly. <laughs> and why should we grow vegetables? Well, as gardeners, I just love to grow anything. So um, <laughs> that one's the easy one for me. Well, there's lots of good. Well, for, first of all. Okay. We're going to go ahead. You're going to do it. There's lots of good go reasons ahead. for going it, and I can see you've got the next slide up already. Carry on. Yeah. Okay. You can, you can uh, butt in at any time. We can save money, money on groceries because buying groceries, buying, uh, buying groceries, <laughs> I'll get it out. Buying vegetables is um, more expensive. <laughs> Growing vegetables, I have it written down wrong here. Growing vegetables is less expensive than purchasing them at the supermarket. Now, some people say gardening can be expensive, so it depends on whether you get a productive crop. But um, there are other reasons. Um, if you only get a few things, it's worth growing your own. Um, this one I had to get the definition from the internet um, because I wasn't exactly sure what you meant by food security. So we can guarantee our food security, but what is food security? Food security is, defi is defined by the United Nations Committee, a mission in which all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And over the coming decades, a changing climate, growing global population, rising food prices, and environmental stressors will have uncertain impacts on our food security. Being in a town that uh, doesn't currently have a grocery store because ours burnt down, sometimes I can't even go and buy radishes. So, <laughs> so it depends. We kind of eat as per what the store has at the time. So, so and, and here, where we do have lots of grocery stores, 
For some people, food security is still very much an issue, especially at the low end of the economic spectrum, because buying fresh fruits and vegetables, as you said earlier, is, is generally more expensive. And so they don't, they aren't able necessarily to buy all those good healthy foods that we need for our good health. So food security and certain, certain economic sectors is certainly an issue. The other issue around food security is that I think um, there is in the food supply chain about a day and a half's worth of food. So when we have major events like the East Coast when they had a hurricane and the stores closed down, the trucks can't get through, there's flooding, the grocery store shelves get cleaned out very quickly. Right? Yeah, within about a day or two. And here we have our highway closed down very often in the winter time. Exactly. And so that also causes food security issues. So if you have access to food that you have grown yourself, that you have frozen or preserved in some way, you can always buffer yourself against those kinds of, you know, outages, right? So that's part of the food security picture as well. Yeah, and they always say to have three days of food and water and everything ahead for emergencies, but I have like three months ahead, so <laughs> I'm always well prepared because I have a garden. Yeah, exactly. So if you grow your own vegetables, even if it's only a few, you'll need to do fewer trips to the grocery store, which will reduce your own carbon emissions. Right. And that's true for anyone that likes to go shopping on a daily basis instead of a weekly or a monthly basis. If you're always running to the store, if you can go to your backyard or your front yard or your pots on the deck, you can pick some of your own things. And uh, especially when you're in a rush, you can grow out, go out, grab a few tomatoes and some salad and throw together a salad, even if you don't have anything else prepared. <laughs> And do you know where your food comes from? I do because I grow my own vegetables. And uh, I think it's really important, Ingrid, that uh, we know where our vegetables come from because I hear scary stories of some, you know, of, of where things come from in China, like the, the spring onions are grown in China. We don't know under what conditions or what pesticides are applied. And <clears throat> well, and that, that's part of the issue is that in some countries, um, their uh, regulations around the use of pesticides are different than ours. Now, the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency still protects us because anything that gets imported into Canada has to be tested and it still has to meet our standards. However, I mean, they, you know, they're, it's spot testing, so there are still, we know that some foods contain uh, certain levels of pesticides. I think it's more around, you know, the whole local food movement, which is to buy food that is grown locally in your area. And so, you know, growing it in your backyard is as local as you can get. Yeah, the 100 mile challenge is the is less than a 100 foot challenge here. Exactly. So, you know, being able to source a good amount of your food from your, from your own backyard, you know, you can't get any more local than that. And, you know, uh, we have to think about the fact that we're importing food from places like China and India. You know, I dill pickles on the grocery store shelf here are from India. Oh my goodness. Because, <laughs> and I, I got 250 pounds of cucumbers last year out of my two greenhouses. Right. And that was just one crop. Exactly. So, you know, that's, those are all benefits. Okay. And you'll eat uh, high quality vegetables at the peak of freshness. And you can't get any fresher than picking off the vine and eating a tomato warm. Oh my goodness, especially the little, the little small button tomatoes there, the cherry tomatoes. They, they almost taste like grapes when you pick them. Absolutely. And I can grow my own vegetables that you can't buy at the store. I can grow varieties that are more flavorful. 
heirloom and old varieties that are different in color, taste, texture, and size. Types with beautiful shapes and colors that can be grown in my flower garden and types that will attract a wide varieties of bees and butterflies. Grow any of the uh, beets that are different colors and carrots that are purple and white and yellow. Love them. <laughs> and it's such a great, you know, it's, it's such a great variety to be able to go. I love looking at seed catalogs especially ones that have heirloom seeds in them, just to see some of the interesting varieties of things that you can grow, which you would never find in a grocery store. Yeah, and I noticed um, I always buy heirloom varieties if I have a choice to. Like I, I have the catalog and I noticed they don't have the same varieties every year. So if you have a San Marzano tomato you bought one year, some seed for the next year because they want to make sure their seed is true to type so some years they wind up not, not growing that variety and kind of skip a year so I'm always keeping some extra seed on hand in case. And getting started we're going to cover everything you need to get started growing your own vegetables but don't take notes. This video will be available for viewing time and time again, so sit back and relax. How do I grow vegetables and how do I get started growing a vegetable garden? First, look at your own space and think about the time you want to spend growing vegetables. Do you have the room, the time, and the energy for a full-size vegetable garden? like a smaller garden that is easier to care for and takes up less space. Back or front yard, separate vegetable garden, raised beds, containers, or mixed in with flowering plants, a vegetable garden can be grown anywhere. Do you have any uh, balconies that you keep vegetables on, Ingrid? Uh, no, I, I have a... <laughs> I have more than enough space. I do grow some things, uh, herbs mostly, and pot, sometimes lettuces or kale in pots that I can keep close to the house, but I don't. Um, we have run balcony workshops for people that do garden on balconies, but I don't personally have one. I also keep my lettuce in pots to keep them away from the slugs because the slugs climb walls here. <laughs> so you've got to make sure you can keep, they'd have to climb the wall and then get up to the pot and then climb down into the pot before they could get it. So my lettuce actually, I don't even try to grow it in the garden anymore. I So that's a, that's a tip for northern gardeners that are really overrun by slugs and snails. <clears throat> And once you've decided where you'll put your garden, you need to choose a garden style. So just think for a minute. Do you like straight rows and orderly rows like soldiers lined up in a row? Or do you like a mixed border of plants with a variety of colors? I like that one personally. That's very cool. The neat rows of a traditional garden were adopted from the farm garden with focus on row and plant spacing designed to make the plants accessible. Great if you have lots of space to work with. The French potager or kitchen garden is both decorative and functional. Usually consisting of symmetrical raised beds with plants repeated in each bed rather than having one bed of all the same plant. Each person knows what style of garden they like, so why should a vegetable garden be any different? You don't need to have a traditional vegetable patch. Try thinking outside the box or inside if that's your preference. When starting a vegetable garden, large or small, keep it sim simple in the beginning. to how to design a garden. I wanted to ask you about the simplicity of starting a garden and not getting overrun 
not getting too big with your ideas to begin. <laughs> I know when I planned my garden, because the area was huge, um, when, when I put up my greenhouses, two 24 foot long by 12 foot greenhouses, plus a patch behind, <laughs> I, I overestimated how much work that would take the first year. So I think all that you can grow on is important. Don't you agree? Absolutely. I think um, and I've done, you know, I've talked to a lot of young families who, you know, they've bought a new house, they have a back garden, and they decide they want to start a vegetable garden. And that is what I advise them. Keep, start small initially, pick maybe four or five vegetables that you want to try growing, you know, um, and everybody can name pretty much the top five, because if you've got kids, they want to grow carrots. You know, usually people want to grow a tomato or two and maybe some peppers. And then um, if you want to do salads, you know, cucumbers and, and, uh, and lettuce. So stick to something fairly simple. Um, and, you know, it doesn't even have to be huge. A 10 by 10 foot garden is more than enough to, cre you know, create and produce enough food for one family for at least a few months, right? So mm -hmm. and then once you start to um, become successful, it'll, it'll then allow you to realize how much work it is and to sort of build upon that. But I think what happens is if people go too big at once, they get overwhelmed, the garden gets full of weeds, and they may decide to quit or decide that it's just too much work. And that's unfortunate. So the, the key yes. to I think is a really important for a beginner. Somebody who's just starting out, I think, you know, the keep it simple rule is really important. So let's evaluate the spot you have chosen for exposure to sun, wind, and rain. Sorry. Vegetables, energy to grow fast and large. So the sunny spot in your garden should be where you plant your vegetables. But there are some leafy green vegetables that will grow in partial shade environment if you don't have a sunny spot. On a balcony like this one, wind may be a problem for large leaf plants, and you may get no rain if another balcony sits above it, which would require more watering by hand. Think about where you'll get your water and how you'll get the water to the plants. Having a hose that reaches your garden is much easier than carrying water buckets by hand. We don't want our precious vegetables to dry out and wilt. And like you were saying, determine what you like to what you want to grow by choosing what you like to eat. Exactly. Yeah. If you love tomatoes and grow them, then then grow them and forget about the f growing the food you aren't fond of. Because you can have tons and tons of zucchinis. I got 200 pounds last year and I wound up giving away most of them. <laughs> Although I love zucchini, there was just no way I could eat them all. I think I still have some in my freezer from last year. So do I, so do I. <laughs> and be patient with yourself. Enjoy your gardening successes and learn from your mistakes. Look for other gardeners that live close to you. Did Bob down the street grow big zucchinis, but yours are shriveled up and being eaten by slugs? Ask Bob how he grows his zucchinis. Gardeners are happy to share their experiences. And from my experience with this, um, I know that some softer, more tender zucchinis um, will be eaten by the slugs within a couple of days. And my zucchinis are hard as nails heirloom variety called Black Beauty. And as long as I can get them past day four, cannot eat through the skin because the skin is hard as acorn squash. Wow. As long as I can get them past uh, day four, the, mm -hmm. the slugs are no longer a problem. So they'll get a few in the really tiny stage, but uh, after that, then I don't. And you have to grow plants that are resistant to the pests and diseases in your area. In Northern Ontario, that's cold tolerant, 
and um, uh, yeah, mainly cold tolerant, but slugs and snails and voles and moles and and that can survive all those things will do well. So do you have specific uh, tolerances that you have to have on your plants to grow where you are? Well, certainly um, slugs are an issue here. Um, I haven't had as much problem on my zucchini with slugs, but I mean, I do have slugs in my garden. So I put straw down around my plants and that hopefully that stops some because they don't like the straw because it's prickly. So that helps to protect them. Um, the big problem that we have with squashes, including zucchini, is we have a squash borer and it will get right into the stem and all of a sudden, um, and especially if it's at the base of the stem, within days your entire squash plant just keels over and dies because well, they have them out. So, sometimes uh, it's better to live in the north where we have no squash borers because it's too cold. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's just... Um, and, and that's relatively recent here as well. I don't know if it's coming, it must be coming up from the south. So um, I didn't have as much problem last year with it in my garden, but I do know of other people who lost a lot of squash plants because of squash borer. So. Well, you can keep them down there, but with climate change, I don't know what the uh, future will bring, but uh, let's hope. The big problem that we have here are rodents like, um, chipmunks, rabbits, some voles, um, but I, I'm, I lose a lot of my strawberries to uh, chipmunks. If I don't net them, the birds also help themselves. Big problem, of course, is rabbits. We have a lot of... Yeah, I don't have as many rabbits, rabbits because we have a lot of hawks and eagles and owls, but uh, the voles are massive. They are almost the size of rats up here. They're huge. <laughs> Oh dear. I mean, we don't have rats. We have just mice, but the voles are, and they actually lifted my potatoes out of the garden last year and sat on top eating them while I was watching them. They pulled the whole potato out, the seed potato, <laughs> and left them on the top of the ground. <laughs> just oh, huge. Boy. Those are used to, gigantic voles. I used to, yeah, I used to wonder why there was always big moleskin stuff they sold in the store. And now and I'm thinking, it's moleskin. <laughs> They're huge. <laughs> okay, onward and upward. Why not try some new vegetables and are interesting? And oh, Ingrid, if you look in the seed catalogs, you can get hybrid seeds and heirloom seeds and things from other countries and uh, it, it's unbelievable the things you can grow now if you just get a seed catalog with pictures you don't even need to read it it's just looking at all these interesting things like decorative peppers that you can grow like a flower because of all the tiny beautiful little peppers that look like little balls on it like christmas balls <clears throat> So, down to the science. Vegetables can be divided into categories. Vegetables can be categorized as cool season crops or warm season crops. And I think this confuses people sometimes, which means the plants are either frost hardy or frost tender. Frost hardy crops prefer, prefer cool growing weather. For example, cabbage, leaf lettuce, onions, parsley, peas, and spinach. And frost tender vegetables planted until the soil warms up. And these include corn, cucumbers, green beans, peppers, and tomatoes. And I don't think it's an easy list to remember. I think that's where the problem is that people is a is it supposed to be planted in cool or warm or they just think they can drop a seed in the ground and it's going to germinate no matter what but i think if they really understand that there's crops that like cool temperatures and crops that like warm temperatures then they can decide whether they have to start them inside or whether they can be planted outside exactly so, and, and I don't know what the planting dates up there are, but here I generally, as a rule of thumb, I mean, 
here everybody runs out to the garden centers on the Victoria Day weekend and buys their stuff. And some people even want to plant their tomatoes ahead of that. And I always tell them, you know what? Tomatoes don't like the, the temperature. The air might be warm enough, but the soil is not. And they don't like cold soil. So generally, I tell people as a rule of thumb, wait until June 1st. Usually, yeah. the soil is warm enough. This year, I think, was a bit of an exception. I haven't put my tomatoes in yet because we had, until two days ago, cold, chilly weather. So I guess yes, and we had we had frost three days ago. So. <laughs> so yours would be later in June, I would think, than you would be planting outside. Yes, June fifteenth is the standard date here. Okay. okay, vegetables can be categorized by life cycles as well. So annuals that grow, reproduce, and die in one season. Biennials grow the first season and reproduce and die in the second year, or perennials that live multiple years. This is an annual that completes its life cycle in one season, whereas carrots are biennials that develop a deep tap root the first season, that's our standard carrot, and then um, flower in the second season, and then obviously die once they set seed. Eggplant is a perennial that is grown as an annual in our climate because it can't overwinter. In Ontario, it can barely survive the summer. Mm -hmm. But asparagus is a hardy perennial with tips that can be harvested annually. And you said you have asparagus, didn't you? I do. I have, a, I have about 40 asparagus plants. And how long does it take to get a patch once you start with a few asparagus plants? So for me, this is year four from seed. So um, the first year, um, all I got is very fine, ferny growth, and I just I spaced them all out into the bed. And then the following year, I didn't harvest anything. Last year, I harvested for the first time, selectively, a little bit from each plant, not very much at all. And this year, we've had a bigger harvest. So. Um, and, and earlier, I think I've been harvesting since late April, and I've just stopped. Um, I think I just did my last crop of asparagus uh, this past week and made a batch of asparagus soup. So about six weeks, um, and now I'm letting the plants grow on, and I'm hoping that next year's harvest will be even bigger, except I'm dealing with and asparagus. And I, I don't beetles. think... I don't think a lot of people realize that the asparagus we get is the first growing tips of the plant in the in the spring. And then you have to let the plant grow bigger yes. and collect, do its photosynthesis to put the energy back into the root to grow early in the spring the next year. Exactly. And there are a number of different types of uh, asparagus there are actually a couple of varieties that were developed at the university of guelph that are hardy in ontario so um i don't know if they're hardy as far north as where you are but they are certainly hardy down here uh guelph uh i want to say guelph millennium i think is one um and there's another one which is i only have one plant of it it's called uh giant purple giant and i'm oh. not the spears are probably a good inch and a half in diameter and they are deep purple. Wow. Those might not be as hardy for up here, the bigger ones, but I know there are people that grow asparagus around here, whether they do extra measures to cover them in the winter. I haven't really asked or looked into it. I'm not a real fan of asparagus, so like I've been telling everyone, grow what you like <laughs> so I can learn something from you. You know, if you if you don't like it, then there's no point in wasting garden space on it. No, and fertilizer and time. Time is precious. True. Cool season plants. Are plants that are of mid-spring to germinate and get growing before the heat of summer. And depending on the spring, in northern Ontario, you can start to seed these frost-hardy plants outside as early as mid to late May. So the May 24th weekend for us is when we'd be 
carrots and our radishes, which I did. Okay. And I put some in raised beds because last year I had too much water in my bed and the ground is so cold, I decided, well, I'm going to warm it up faster. Even though the plants can stand the cold, the ground is too cold <clears throat> at that time of year because the frost is still coming out of the ground. Yeah. On May 24th. I mean, sometimes we can have two feet of snow in the bush on May 24th weekend. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Some vegetables can be started earlier than others. For example, peas can be planted as soon as the ground can be worked, but cabbage should be started later. Therefore, always check your seed packages for planting time and conditions and check the expiration date as well. I keep having people say, I have some seed for you, but seed doesn't last forever just because they're in a package. Some plants taste better after the cold weather of fall and early winter. This is something that a lot of people don't know and they go and cut their kale and dig up their carrots and parsnips. But um, a little bit of frost or a tiny bit of snow um, just makes my kale look prettier <laughs> with a little bit of snow on it and it'll make uh, the tender shoots taste a little sweeter. And you can store carrots under and parsnips under the ground as long as you can dig them up and as long as they don't freeze if they have a little bit of snow on top of them. Do you get enough snow that you have to pull your carrots right away or can you leave them in the ground a long time? No, we don't. We can't go here and get reliable snow cover anymore. So we can have hard frost long before we have enough of a snow cover on the ground or vice versa. I mean, this year we were fortunate. We had, I think, the first serious snowfall in November. And I had not planted all my bulbs yet. And I discovered that I could still get, I just had to move the snow and the soil underneath it was not frozen. So <laughs> if I had had carrots still in the ground, I could have harvested those. I didn't have any uh, left at that point, but, um, it, but that with us, it's not necessarily reliably the case. We could have a hard frost and the frost going in the ground without snow cover. So, you know, you kind of have to dig them up. I would recommend. I think, I think it's got to go by area. Everyone will know their area. And if it happens once, you, you're going to know whether things survive or not. Exactly. <laughs> Onward and upward. So the plants that you seed outdoors, you can seed outdoors in your pots are leafy greens, root vegetables, and peas. In fact, root veggies and peas don't like to be transplanted, so it's best to start them from seed in the spot where they'll grow. Potted plants will need more fertilizer than vegetables in the ground. Leafy greens require more nitrogen, the first number on the store-bought fertilizer. This is important. When you buy fertilizers, there's three numbers. And first um, number on the package mean is nitrogen. And the second number is what helps the fruiting vegetables. They need more phosphorus. Okay, something just fell beside me. So, And the roots are potassium, which is the third number on the fertilizer. And a fertilizer for vegetables, that um, is the second number that you're looking for that puts down roots. Is that correct or makes the bulb or the fruit? The bulb is the potassium the third number Ingrid uh, NPK yes so nitrogen phosphorus potassium K is the initial for potassium so um, in in general nitrogen is, is the one required for leafy greens um, and um, things like natural fertilizers like bone meal which create high or which contain high potassium are good for things like bulbs because you want something that is going to help feed 
the roots and grow those bulbs so that they will bloom next year. So that's kind of a general, and then for anything that's blooming or fruiting, the middle number, which is uh, phosphate. And do you agree that you should follow the rec directions of the fertilizer you're using? Because the amount of fertilizer in those concoctions are different in every well, well, the numbers the numbers that come on a fertilizer container, um, and I usually I generally tend to go with a water soluble one because I find that uh, generally um, is easier. You can measure it, you put it into your you know, your watering uh, container, and you just go and, and water it. Um, so the numbers tell you the percentages of each one. So a 10, 10, 10 meat, you've got 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, and 10% potassium, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it will tell you the strength that you want to do it. I generally tend to go, I err on the weak side as opposed to the strong side. That's so just you it. Especially when plants are very small and very young. So the recommendation on a fertilizer package is for mature plants. But when you're starting a vegetable garden, those plants are very small and they're not consuming a lot of uh, nutrients from the soil yet. So in my mind, I would rather go and err on the side of, of very dilute to start with. You know, it could be a 50% solution until the plants start to mature. Great, great. We're having, We're having an echo problem here. <laughs> I just want to check because we're having a double echo problem. I'm not hearing an echo here. Okay. I think it stopped. Don't ask me what happened. Okay. Um, when searching for varieties, Look for plants labeled compact, bushy, balcony, or baby plants if you're putting them in containers. Correct, Ingrid? Yeah, as a general rule, you want to try and go for something that is going to be a dwarfing or smaller plant than you would normally put in a full size garden because, you know, a container is going to restrict the growth anyway, so you might as well go for a plant that's going to be smaller and not get overrun well you know because if you take a a plant like a tomato plant try and grow it in a container i mean you know, it's going to be huge it you know? better be a hanging <laughs> plant <laughs> okay leafy greens are easy to grow and often quite pretty with ruffled leaves and different colors there are a number you can choose from plant them in containers that are large and shallow. Um, it says here eight inches deep, 20 centimeters, and eight, 18 inches round or 45 centimeters. Um, really large pot for lettuce, or is that a multiple, a uh, few lettuce in the pot at once? Sorry. Eight by 18, 18 inches deep. You I mean, 18 grow. inches round and eight inches deep. If you've got an 18 inch, so that's, and I do have a bowl that I, I bought once and I think I could grow like, you know, um, six to 10, depending on the size of the lettuce plants in there. And if it's, if you're mixing it up with like, you know, arugula or maybe some of the small, um, you know, mescaline or mashes, you could pack lots of plants in there because you're constantly harvesting, right? The good thing about yeah. greens is you're always you're always cutting, you're always harvesting, so they don't really get too crowded. Yeah, cut and come again. <clears throat> exactly. So be creative with your choices. Here you can see a shopping bag with different leaf lettuces, or try a shopping basket lined with landscape fabric or burlap to hold the soil in. And always allow for drainage by putting holes in the container. It or burlap will let water run through. Um, you can extend your harvest by staggering your planting. You can reseed every two weeks or so. Um, up here, I'd say I start in mid-June. 
uh, because of the cold. But if you wanted to start it in the house, if they're pots, technically you could start them in the house a week or two ahead, but they like sunshine. So I wouldn't be keeping them into the in the house, even under grow lights for too long. I noticed the grow lights do a good job, but they're not perfect. They just love it when they get put out on the deck. And we we're talking about cutting the lettuces, just cut the leaves near the base and new ones will grow to harvest again in a few weeks. This can usually be done two or three times. And do add some soluble fertilizer every two weeks or so. And you were talking about diluting the mix instead of, uh, um, it did say, uh, because I am adapting this from another presentation about, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to cough, <coughs> that um, the container plants need more fertilizer. Would I be concerned that the fertilizer may build up in those pots if it was fertilized too often? No, because you're watering constantly, right? So depending on ah. that, so what's actually happening is that you're leaching most of the fertilizer right out of the bottom. So Especially the nitrogen. Exactly. And so um, that's why the rule of thumb is to, you know, if you're growing in containers, that you need to be fertilizing it regularly because containers require that much more water than plants growing in, say, a garden. Um, you will end up leaching most of the nutrient out and or a, a lot of the nutrient out and so you need to be constantly adding and you're growing in a medium which is typically not um, garden soil right it's usually a soilless mix in a container and so that's another reason very good explanation so that's another reason okay good explanation makes everything clear Hang on, got a small computer glitch here. Okay, think of combining different colors or flavors. And yes, all these mixes do have different flavors, even if people don't believe us. Um, there's buttery, peppery, nuttery, <laughs> nutty, nutty flavors to these uh, mixes. And I love all the different flavors. Uh, you might try arugula, leaf lettuce, like red garnet, garnet oak leaf and I have grown the oak leaf it's very easy to grow and I've uh, spinach swiss chard my favorite um, ruby red swiss chard or bright lights I have that and uh, and bright lights is different colors yellow orange red what I love about the swiss chard <coughs> excuse me is um, the leaves, green leaves, and then bright yellow or red veins that look like stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really pretty. And kale, I love my kale. I'm growing dinosaur kale this year. Um, mustard, ruby streaks. I have never heard of ruby streaks mustard, but I love uh, mustard leaves. And is it mache? Is that how you say mache? <laughs> big seeded, which is heat tolerant. Collards. I've never grown collards. I've never eaten collards, so <laughs> we're going to have to try it. Crests called wrinkled crinkled or a baby mescaline salad mix with curly endive, red leaf baby lettuces, escarole, and a mild leafy chicory, and chervil, and baby bok choy. It's making me hungry. Uh -huh. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, my allergies are making me cough. And herbs that can take some cold and can combine with salads are parsley, chives, mint, and lemon balm. And my lemon balm will not grow in my garden. Be either it's too cold here. I know my sister grows it in her garden in Timmins, but she has a protective um, wall of cedar around, and I believe it's zone four. And Timmins is about zone three, and we're zone two here. So. But just get a lemon <laughs> and keep the keep the skin. The problem with lemon balm down here is it becomes weedy. Oh, does it? 
you, so it goes everywhere and we can't grow it here uh-huh it's like mint it yes oh, oh well believe me we can grow mint mint is everywhere you can't get rid of mint here mint is the worst even though me hey i like the smell but um, it is a weed yes uh root vegetables potatoes can be grown in raised beds five gallon containers about one per potato per three gallons of soil or even in old tires grow early varieties like first earlies klondike rose chieftain or french fingerling that sounds good but i've never tried that i think i have some seed potatoes that i haven't planted yet and i bought a potato growing bag this year so Ooh. i'm going to try that i've tried the the um garbage can and that and what i will say that i have learned from growing potatoes in containers is to do a little bit of research before you do it because there are some potatoes that will do well in a container you know the the kind where you put the you put a little bit of soil in you put the potato in you put some soil you wait until it grows and you keep adding soil and it's supposed to grow potatoes along the stem well some varieties of potatoes don't do that. so research your potato variety before you decide how you're going to plant it <laughs> yes a lot of people put out videos that show them doing the potato and they don't show the outcome at the end. So research the outcome before you do yeah. the beginning part. <clears throat> and plant seed potatoes lower in the container with at least five inches of soil on the bottom and keep mounting up soil up and around the plant once there is four inches of green growth and keep mounding the soil as the top grows until you reach the top of the container or until you're any farther in your case and containers to choose from could be potato sacks uh, cloth shopping bags or like you were saying a garbage can maybe a small one or cans and um, I like the shopping bags I get from the grocery store the cloth shopping bags and I wanted to try them with potatoes but uh, I haven't yet and it's something I've got to try in the future and do you want to tell everyone why you have to mound your soil up why it's so important um, for potatoes yes it's one of those plants that um, grows the the actual nodules which turn into tubers grows along the stem so the more you mound the soil up the more st underground stem you're creating the more potatoes you will actually get so it's important that once you plant it as it grows you keep mounding or hilling they call it hilling potatoes so that you in fact get um, more potatoes growing along that the stem of the potato and what about the green on potatoes oh, if they're not right. covered? Sorry, that's another, yes, that's another good point. One of the other reasons why you want to constantly be healing potatoes up is that potatoes, when exposed to um, light, will actually develop green on them. And the green on a potato is toxic uh, because it's a uh, solanaceous, which is the, uh, the family that they're from. Um, that actually is a toxin and so what you want to do is make sure that your potatoes that have started to develop on the roots are always well covered with soil so you always want to be sure you're mounding up for that reason as well and that you cannot boil the toxins out of a green potato no. it is still there even once it's boiled so if you have a green potato don't don't use either. it Throw it away on to beets two to four weeks before the last frost date and soaking seeds overnight will help in their germination as will cracking them with a rolling pin but i don't think i'd go that far <laughs> unless i couldn't get them to germinate uh, beet seeds are multi-germ meaning that they're a cluster of seeds so you'll get you will need to thin your seedlings to at least two to four inches apart now this is this is a problem I think with all beginner gardeners is they do not want to thin their plants because they've spent so much time trying to grow the plants they think the more the merrier 
the more carrots and the more beet little plants they'll get more mm -hmm. but if you don't out the ones between and leave the spacing suggested by the seed package like two inches four inches whatever it is they won't have the nutrients and they won't have the room to actually grow their tap root to the size of a beet or a carrot they'll just be literally pushed out correct exactly exactly and that's that's the issue is that you want to have so you know the, the the pinching out will actually give you more space for the individual beets to grow um, and and develop that good root, which which is what's important about a beet. And the cool thing is that by pinching out, you can always throw those um, small baby um, beet plants into salads, the greens anyway. So you know yeah, the beet tops, beet yeah. tops. Everyone goes and buys beet tops and pays a fortune and you've got these gourmet tiny little beet tops that you can throw in your salad and say you have gourmet salad so for people who don't want to have to do that there is a solution because they now sell and i noticed them a lot more this spring than i have in previously they sell seed tapes so they're pre-spaced <laughs> It's for people. Yeah, so you just you just unroll your tape onto your garden or onto your pot, and they're spaced exactly. But you do have three seeds, maybe to the to each seed, isn't that correct? Because they are well, multi-germ. Yeah, I don't know if they've actually. That's what the rolling pin trick is for. So if you take a rolling pin over some beet seeds, you're actually breaking the clusters of seeds up. And, and breaking them into individual seeds. Um, so I don't know, I, I've never grown from tape, so that's, you know, there's a, a something. Another thing we have to do. <laughs> thing, we're gonna run down to the store now and buy a tape of, uh, of beet seeds and throw them into the garden just to see how they grow. Because that's a good question, I don't know. Yes. yes, because I'm wondering whether they have divided those seeds or whether they're still multi-germination, they're going to be three in each place and you still have to thin them. Right, and Swiss chart is the same because it's the same family. So they yeah. do the same thing. So just get out there and thin your Swiss chart and your beets. Have enough room for the strongest. Take out the weakest ones. Leave the biggest ones. Okay, just got to get to my notes here. Is peas like long, cool days and can even withstand a little bit of frost. Therefore, plant seeds in the early spring or late in the season for a fall harvest. Well, within, we've got two to three months of summer, so we're pushing it, trying to later, but uh, because all our summer days are cool at night, but um, pea seeds will germinate in soil temperatures as low as five degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And I did plant mine out at the main run. So, um, but um, they, they, if they get a hard, cold temperature, like a freeze, if they have germinated, uh, you will lose them. So you may have to cover them if you're going to get down to freezing temperatures. The frost, frost here happens around four degrees. But um, once you're hitting below freezing, I'd be saying, but the nice thing is, if you do lose an early crop and you get a freeze, just plant again. Just put in some more seeds. Exactly. And you can encourage germination by pre-sprouting your seeds. I've never done that because there's always enough water in our soil in the spring to uh, germinate them. Uh, you can soak them for 8 to 10 hours in a shallow dish of water. I suspect that it should be warm water, room temperature, not cool or too hot. And drain, drain and place the soak seeds between damp paper towels, which I've never done, and place them in an open plastic bag. So what what would you say about pre-germinating pea seeds? Have you ever I done it? Never bothered. <laughs> yeah, because as soon as you put them in the ground, they just pop right up. <laughs> they, they seem to germinate relatively quickly. I did mine in April, and uh, they were up pretty fast, so um, I've never... I mean, I've done it to show how quickly 
seeds can actually germinate. And I have shown people how to do it with the wet paper towel, actually moist paper towel, not wet. Um, so that's just to show people how quickly you can do it. But um, I'm not certain that I would ever bother because, you know, I just put peas straight into the ground. I'm like you, right? It's mm -hmm. not worth it. And pea plants are cool weather plants, so they stop producing when the temperature goes above 20, it says 24 degrees Celsius. So have you had that problem if uh, they're in a greenhouse or someplace and it gets too warm, do they stop producing? Pretty, yeah, I don't know about 24 because, you know. The, that's normal temperature. That's normal around here. I mean, that's the temperature we're going to have this week and my peas haven't flowered yet. So I'm hoping <laughs> that, you know, I'm going to start seeing flowers on my peas now and that I'll get a crop before the real heat of summer hits. But they do, by the time summer comes along, now I keep mine in a spot where they do get a bit of afternoon shade, which keeps them producing a little bit longer. But by the time we get consistent days of, say, 30 degrees, then, yeah, the peas are done. Yeah, I think 30 degrees are the uh, the more temperature that uh, they would stop at. So we've got to get along here or we'll never. Um, peas require good support to produce, and they like full sun but can tolerate partial shade. And you can grow peas in a deep container that is at least three gallons. Uh, bushel baskets or barrels work well. I'm not going to go through all the varieties because there's an unlimited number of varieties. Warm season plants should be planted after all threat of frost is passed. And here, that's traditionally June 15th in Northern Ontario or the May 24th weekend if you're farther south. Warm season plants are beans, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, and melons. Although some of the plants that love hot weather do better in a greenhouse up here, like hot peppers and melons. And I was overrun by spaghetti squash that I thought was cucumbers that wound up growing with my cucumbers in my greenhouse. The uh, spaghetti squash actually grew up to the roof of the greenhouse and all the way down the greenhouse so I had 24 feet of <laughs> spaghetti squash wow. hanging from the ceiling and all the huge spaghetti squash hanging my brother took a picture so I love heat and this is in at the roof of the greenhouse in the oh, middle awesome. of the summer <laughs> It looked like a jungle. Yeah, peppers and eggplants love heat too. And what I often recommend for people to do is to try and build um, a, a protected kind of box area where it gets a, I've seen actually people do it with like window panes, not enclosed on the top, but at least the sides so that it's protected mm -hmm. from wind and you're really concentrating the sun because I know that, you know, pepper and eggplant love that kind of thing. <clears throat> and what I found this year at the dollar store are something called cloches. Have you ever heard of those, Pam? Yes, yes. Plastic ones for two, I think there's a pack of, I don't, I can't remember how much they're, $2 a pop and they come with a little, um, uh, what are they? Clips that you can actually put them into the ground. So um, yeah. I, bought, I found four. I bought four and I thought my when I put my pepper plants out, I'm going to, while they're still young, I'm going to cover them so that they'll get more heat concentrated into them so they'll grow faster, hopefully. So I'll, I'll report and that. And it does grow, it, it does heat up the ground too around it. Exactly. That's why I have my greenhouses to warm up the ground faster. Because just even even though the, I haven't planted in my greenhouse yet, because it's not June fifteenth, it's warming the ground considerably compared to outside of the greenhouse. And, and in where we are, raised beds do that as well. So a ra building a raised bed, and mine are about twelve inches deep, and that twelve inches sitting above ground, those will warm up. They'll dry more quickly, and they'll warm up more quickly. And so and the sun will hit the sides too. So. Exactly. And the rain, so having a raised bed will also give you maybe two weeks advantage over um, just having straight um, earth on the ground, like flat earth. 
or extend the season in the other and, end. And it'll extend the season the other way as well. Yes. So many of these plants require you to start the seeds inside to transplant into your pots outside once all risk of frost has passed. Or you could purchase transplants at the time of planting. These warm season plants require a longer growing season and would not fruit if started side. These are tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, tom tomatillos, and ground cherry fall into this category. I've never grown a tomatillo or a ground cherry and I don't know if they grow up here but uh, we do grow peppers and tomatoes. I haven't tried the eggplant up here. I've done eggplant. I usually do it in a I buy the smaller eggplants and I, I've grown them in containers. I haven't actually grown them in the garden. So properly pronounced tomatillo there we go, tomatillo. Tomatillo. I grew them one year because that's what is used uh, in Mexico to make the um, salsa verde, which is green salsa. And I thought, oh, yes, and I love salsa. Yes, well, salsa verde is something that you know I'll have once in a while, but I don't eat buckets of it. But a to one single tomatillo plant will grow into a bush that's probably at least four feet wide and four feet high and is covered with these green fruits that are covered in this papery husk. And let me tell you that I have, and I think I had two plants, and it just took over an entire section of my garden. And I thought, oh my goodness. I had so many, I didn't know what to do with them. So it's now on. Now I'm going to have to try them. <laughs> never plant, it's on my list of never plant that one again, Ingrid. So, you know. Well, maybe up here the cold would keep it into a normal space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, beans are warm weather plants and should be directly seeded into their final place as they do not transplant well. Grow them in the ground or in a three gallon or larger container. They require full sun and good drainage. And when planting them, mix in two inches of compost or well-rotted manure into the pot. They love manure. Mm -hmm. This will help uh, with nutrients and providing the beans with what they need to grow and produce well. <clears throat> and this is runner beans are widely grown in Europe and are extremely vigorous vines that can reach up to 20 feet. I have them planted outside. They are more cold tolerant than common beans. And yes, they mine have been outside now for almost a week. And many runner beans are grown for their colorful blossoms that come in shades of scarlet, salmon, pink, white, or bitone. And if picked immature, they can be used as snap beans or harvested later as shell beans. And this is the popular scarlet runner bean. Runner bean, that's the one I have outside. And I grow them for the hummingbirds. Uh -huh. I couldn't care less about eating the beans, but I grow them for the hummingbirds uh, that climb up and they climb up the deck and cover the whole sides of the deck. And the bees and the butterflies and the hummingbirds just love it. And of course, bean or runner bean, and they require strong vertical supports like my deck. And there are many different kinds of beans. I couldn't find pictures of all of them. Uh, common or string beans are well known and generally have had the string bred out of them and are known as stringless. That's the kind I like. Mm -hmm. uh, in this category, we have pole or bush beans. The pole beans are the long viney ones and the bush beans are the ones that grow. How high do they grow? Two to three feet and that's it? Yeah, they're about, uh, um, they're <laughs> depending on the variety of bush beans, some of them want to sort of, they're, they're kind of half thinking about becoming vines so they kind of sprawl a bit but usually about two, two and a half feet is what they do. Yeah. In they want to sprawl, but I put sticks in the ground to help them actually like uh, bush, dead uh, willow bushes and things yep. like that. I stick them in the ground to help hold them up. Yep. 
And then there's one called shell beans. I don't know what they mean by shell beans. Well, so shell beans are the kind of beans that you don't harvest the pods where you actually wait until the pods completely ripen and then you just shell the beans out of them. So things like fava beans, navy beans, chickpeas, those are all the kinds of legumes that you would actually wait until the shell is completely ripe and allow it to dry and then harvest the dried beans out of it. So they're just dried beans for your consumption yeah. in the winter. <clears throat> and I know the Italians actually harvest fresh fava beans like lima beans. You actually do harvest them before they dry completely. So you have baby lima beans and then you, you don't necessarily have to dry those. I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> And yellow beans are known as wax beans. And there are varieties that grow short and are called bush beans, varieties that grow long vines and called pole beans. And uh, for containers, you will get a higher yield when growing pole beans as you benefit from the vertical space. And I think a lot of community gardens do that. They want to grow things up and have less space on the in their raised beds, so they grow things up. And make sure you harvest frequently to encourage a longer period of tender pods, because if you leave them on, the it is uh, it's like leaving the big tomatoes on the vine and taking off some of the other tiny ones to get bigger tomatoes. So you get bigger beans, but not as many, correct? Well, what happens is the plant thinks it's done its job, it sets seeds, and it doesn't have to bloom anymore. If you keep picking, it will continue to bloom, and, and the blooms get, you know, pollinated, and you get more beans. So you want to always be picking your beans to make sure that the plant uh, stays in continuous bloom for the period that it will. And tomato peppers all require a sunny and warm location. And tomatoes are one of the most popular vegetables grown in Canada and are generally easy to grow. There are two basic types of tomatoes, determinate or the bush tomatoes. They're bare few bear fruit all at once or indeterminate longer period of time and are vining requiring a sturdy pole or trellis. And for containers, growing indeterminate tomatoes vertically offers many advantages. Growing tomatoes against a sturdy support like a tall stake trellis or tower allows the foliage of the plants to be exposed to maximum sunlight and increased air circulation and it's further away from the soil born blight that commonly splashes and damages crops because the blight is splashed from the bottom up is that correct yes it's a big problem down here i don't know if you guys have that problem but we do we have a lot of um, problems with blight so um, the thing to do um, at least what I have discovered and seems to work well for me when I plant my tomatoes I cut the lower branches so you number one you want to plant your tomatoes deeply because they will root along the stem and then I trim the branches for about the first foot off of the tomato plant as it's growing you do this so you keep the first foot clear of branches so that you don't have any leaves close to the ground. Then I mulch it very, I, I, use, um, I use mushroom compost as my first layer of mulch that goes around them. And then I, I mulch them very heavily with another probably four inches of straw. And that stops any water from splashing onto the tomatoes. And then of course put in sturdy supports and tomato cages and um, keep pruning those um, side shoots off. Yeah, the sucker. Uh, not the, is it called suckers? All right, yeah, the, the ones that actually grow it sort of in the in the crotch of the branches. Those are those little suckers. Yeah. Yeah, pruning those off. Yeah, sure them somewhere. Uh, tomatoes will need a large pot, five gallon or larger for one plant. It does take a lot of energy to produce tomatoes, and it needs that soil with the roots. Mm -hmm. 
They get big. And the suckers. Yeah. Uh, of prune them. out the sucker. Pinch them out. Don't let them get too big. Just pinch them out with your finger. And it doesn't take long, and you'll get more tomatoes. And tomatoes are heavy feeders, and you need to enrich the soil with plenty of compost at planting time, and it can be top dressed with compost or um, diluted half strength fertilizer solution every two weeks during the growing season. Um, tomatoes need more phosphorus to grow fruit than nitrogen to grow leaves. And my problem is I've seen many tomato feeds with more nitrogen than phosphorus. So instead of just looking for a tomato fertilizer, look for the higher middle number. Don't you agree, Ingrid? Yeah, I generally find um, a multi-purpose. Um, uh, what did I use? I'm trying to remember. I actually bought one specifically last year for my tomatoes, and I can't remember which, but it was a granular food, and I actually put it right around, might have even been a rose food. <laughs> Um, it it doesn't matter what it's for, as long as it as long as it has the the higher phosphorus number. And I, I just it was granular, and I thought slow release, and I thought this is perfect, and that's what I distributed around the base of my tomato plants. Yeah. And regular, probably daily or more watering, is very important as tomatoes need to be kept moist and evenly watered to avoid blossom end rot. So you don't want a complete drying out and then a soaking. You want just constant. Exactly. And, and so I'm going to interject here because if people go on to the internet, they're going to find all kinds of um, home remedy solutions for blossom end rot, most of which include Epsom salt. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're going to cover that one in the fall. <laughs> yeah, no, don't do it. Don't put Epsom salt on your tomatoes. It's not going to make any darn difference. You know, people say it's a calcium deficiency and that's true, but it's a calcium deficiency that's caused by uneven watering. So the problem, yes. the problem is water. The solution is water regularly. Yes. So I'm going to go out and take, take care of your plants every day. <laughs> don't use Epsom salt. No. And transplanting a transplant egg plants about one week after the last frost. And so that would be the third week of June here. And that's why I don't do egg plants. But they do grow well in large containers or maybe a greenhouse. And one plant for one foot in diameter or a five gallon or larger container, so much like a tomato. Mm -hmm. And use a nutrient rich soil with lots of compost. Keep the soil evenly moist but not soggy, just like a tomato. And feed the plants about once a month with half strength fertilizer. And let us know how it works because I haven't grown them up here. And sweet and hot peppers. Oh, I can grow them in my greenhouse because they like heat in a three gallon or larger container and fertilize with diluted liquid fertilizer. And varieties, there's all kinds of varieties out there and you can grow them up north. Yep, sweet, hot, you name it, whatever variety of pepper you like, they can be grown. And you can buy them already started to grow, like little uh, seedlings already to even with the flowers on them and producing some peppers already. Throw them in the garden, give them a whirl. And my favorite, cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, melons, all part of the, cur I can't even say it. Cucurbit. <laughs> Cucurbit family. It's like a tongue twister. They all require full sun, lots of water. I grow mine in my swamp. I have a swamp in the back and they grow there. I don't have to water them. They suck up as much water as they need and good air circulation. So I actually sit them on top, put soil on top and they, I, I get almost 12 pound squash so wow. and up here that's good in our short season yes so and good air circulation well I have them farther quite far apart so the uh, it, uh, it says to avoid mildew but I don't usually get much mildew because there's nothing else around them they get a lot of wind from all directions and lots of compost manure fertilize 
And it says all these can be grown vertically in containers. Well, technically they can be grown vertically, but you will need a lot of stabilizer for weight. Yes. Just like I did with my greenhouse with rebar for my uh, uh, spaghetti squash. And um, it'll increase your yield, yes, and it'll be easier to pick, but you better not have it collapse. They're going to be heavy. Well, and... Mm -hmm. If you are growing them on a, you not only need to support the vines, you need to support the fruit. So yes. you've got fairly heavy fruit like spaghetti squash. And you may need to, you know, provide some support so that the, the fruit itself doesn't snap off the vine, right? Yes, you can use um, pantyhose. <laughs> That's, what That's what I heard the solution is. Like pantyhose or... Or netting that you can just buy, you know, the kind of netting that you can just create a sling and tie at both ends so that you're actually supporting the fruit on the vine. Pantyhose looks cute. <laughs> and um, always start them indoors ahead of time and you'll get a much faster yield from them. And they do need cross-pollination, which means pollinating from the male plant to the female plant. And um, I'm going to show a picture of this. Not the plant, the male and the female flowers. They produce both, but they need the pollen from the male flower to get over to the female flower. And the female flower has a more bulbous base. It's not as big as this one shown, but the male flower has just a skinny little stem. Right. the the flower and you de do need cross pollination so if you don't have bees or if it's in a greenhouse and you don't have any uh, wasps or bees coming in you may need to uh, hand pollinate from the male flower to the female and they open only for a short amount of time my uh, zucchinis open for an hour or two in the morning and then the uh, flowers close up, the female flowers. So what I do first thing in the morning is run out, grab the male flowers, break one off, stick it inside a female flower, and let the female flower close on top of it. Don't have to worry, even though they're outside and they do get pollinated, but I want to make sure while it's open, it's going to get pollinated. You have a climbing zucchini I'm trying this year, so that should be interesting. And Mac with intensive gardening, square foot gardening, raised beds, container gardening, and succession planting. I don't know how we're going to get through all this tonight. <laughs> Intensives are vegetables and it can be formal or informal and square foot gardening is an example of intensive gardening. Don't change, there we go. Square foot gardening is exactly what it says by gardening one foot squares and it's easy to set up and plant but it does take a lot of energy from the soil so make sure the soil is healthy enough to support the plant growth and you're going to have to fertilize obviously Ingrid I guess in something this intensive um yeah and and so there's two ways of doing it so if you set up a raised box like that um you can make sure that you add a lot of organic matter to it at the beginning of the year when you first plant um and you know if you are growing tomatoes in it you will need to add supplemental um feeding to it of course because tomatoes are and or cabbages are very heavy feeders but if you plant beans for instance then you're fixing uh, nitrogen into the soil so you're kind of you know um putting back and then what i do with my raised boxes is make sure that i add organic matter again in the fall when I'm finished harvesting everything and then those worms in the spring can take it back down into the soil. So I'm always adding um, good organic matter or compost back into them. Sounds good. And raised beds are an ideal vegetables. They're less work. They're easily accessible, reduces the need for weeding, extends the growing season, like you said, because the soil is warmer. Now the initial work is a little bit more difficult because you have to build the raised beds or using something like uh, pots or something like that to raise your beds. I just cut out some bottoms of some large pots to make some small raised beds. And it eliminates the need to remove sod. 
and uh, less bending. Mm, that's the important part. And, <laughs> yeah, and warms up earlier in the spring and continues to be warmer in the fall. And you can maximize limited space by planting vegetables in containers. So ensure, if you're going to do this, <clears throat> excuse me, in, ensure adequate drainage and use a good quality potting soil with compost. Use trellises or poles to use vertical spaces or grow them up a balcony railing. And be creative. You can grow in old rubber boots, old teapots, or anything that will hold soil and has drainage. And succession planting is followed with another after it has been harvested. So peas can be followed by parsnips, carrots, or late potatoes. And planting sequential crops with short production periods mean you can extend your harvest and used it's used to rotate crops as well by replanting the same area with different crops and the usual interval is 7 10 and 14 days and why is soil so important in gardening uh, soil is the soul of your garden it's probably the most important determinant for a successful garden. And many successful gardeners consider that 80% of all plant problems are related to poor soil. So good soil is compos composed of mineral particles, organic matter, air, water, and organisms. It's high in organic matter called humus, it has good moisture retention, has good drainage, not too much, not too little. It's friable, which means it's crumbly in your hands. So it's easy for plant roots to get through. It's high in the principal nutrients of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as many secondary nutrients, such as calcium and iron. Uh, the nitrogen is good for the stem and leaf growth. The phosphorus is good for root and fruit and flower development. Potassium helps disease resistance and promotes vigor in plants. And healthy root development, air, water, and nutrients in the soil. The ideal pH for most plants is between 5.5 and 7.5. <clears throat> and another aspect of soil is its texture. This is determined by the amount of clay, silt in it. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a cough. <laughs> Those allergies. Clay, silt, and sand. Yeah. Uh, the ideal pH for most plants is between 5.5 and 7.5, which can be determined by a soil test, but the store-bought tests give you an idea of your pH range, but a laboratory soil test can give you a more specific result. Do you find that the uh, store-bought soil tests aren't that great? Um, I first did uh, a store-bought soil test, um, and I've done them for fertility, and, you know, it gives you an idea. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think the pH on mine came out about 7 or 7.2, which is fairly accurate for our area, surprisingly enough, because we're, uh, most of the soil in Durham region is, um, is limestone based. So we have fairly alkaline soil here. So it, it's good as an indication, if you really want to understand your soil, um, getting a lab test done is, of course, the best way to do that. And they will make recommendations on what kind of fertilizer to use as well. That's great. Important aspect of soil is texture. And this is the determined by the amount of sand, silt, and clay. And sandy soil has large particles, doesn't retain nutrients or water well, and has good drainage. Clay has tightly packed nutrient richness. Uh, clay, ha I'll get this out. Clay has tightly packed particles, clumps, retain water, is difficult to dig, and drainage is a problem. Sandy loam has the nutrient richness of clay. 
excellent drainage of sand and is found in river valleys and prime farmland. But how do you tell what kind of soil you have? Your soil, squeeze it and open your hand. If it runs through your fingers, it's sandy. And if it holds its shape really well, it's clay. And if it crumbles like chocolate cake, then it's pretty well loam. And you know what you really want is loam. And if you don't have loam, you can work with the rest. Poor soils are soils that are one or all of the following. Nutrient deficient, compacted, consists of subsoil, soil like in new housing developments, sticky clay or pure sand. If you have a long enough growing season, you can help your soil by growing a cover crop in the fall to turn under in the late fall or spring. Um, you till in the cover crops before the seed, head ma seed heads mature so that you don't have a lot of weed seeds. And if you till in the whole plants, allow two to four weeks to decompose. And eight reasons to grow cover crops, to protect bare soil from being washed or blown away, to keep nutrients from being washed out of your soil, and to add even more when using nitrogen fixing plants such as peas, to loosen the soil deeper than you can or want to dig, to increase organic matter, improve soil structure, drainage and aeration, weeds to help beneficial insects and microorganisms over winter to increase yields and break these cycles and to grow your own mulch and compost material. And there are a number of different cover crops you can sow, each with its own benefits. Buckweed is one, it fixes calcium in the soil and it's best for raised beds helps fight cabbage worms, increases the number of predatory ground beetles and other beneficial insects, and enriches the soil. And I like the smell of clover. Mm -hmm. Grow very, very quickly, organic matter to the soil. And fall rye inhibits the germ seeds. So you till in or cut the cover crops before the seed heads mature and you'll improve your soil structure. And a note about composting. Composting provides organic matter to the soil and your goal is to achieve 30% of your soil as organic matter or humus, which is the product of compost. Composting relies on soil bacteria, worms, beetles, fungi, and other things to break down waste and turn it into something that your plants will thrive on. It's light and fluffy textured soil, which improves soil aeration, aeration, beneficial bacteria, nutrients, trace minerals, and will retain moisture. To create a compost pile, alternate brown stuff, such as leaves and cardboard, with green stuff, such as vegetables, grass clippings, and discarded perennials. Uh, they don't recommend peat be thrown in the compost pile because it tends to acidify the soil. But if it's a small amount, I'm not going to worry about it. For 40 to 60 percent moisture content in your compost, it should feel like a just wrung out sponge and it should smell nice. Turning the pile will ensure good airflow and speed up the decomposition. It should be hot in the center of the pile when you turn it, showing you the bacteria are doing their job to break it down. And the ideal compost pile size is one meter square or three by three by three. Do you find that's true, Ingrid? Yeah, pretty much. If they get too big, then they don't get hot enough and it doesn't break down. And if it's uh, too small, you're not getting enough, um, you're getting, it's getting too wet. Um, so that's about the right size. And don't add thick layers of any one kind of waste. So if you go and cut your grass, don't throw it all on the compost pile in one big lump. 
So you want a layer of one layer of the other or just sprinkle stuff here and there. Uh, be careful how much wood chips you add to a compost pile because they take a long time to decompose and during that time they can rob the soil of nitrogen because they actually need nitrogen to break down. And it would be better to use wood chips as a mulch instead of throwing them in the compost pile. If you're interested in trying vermicomposting or worm composting, the end result provides worm castings that are rich in nutrients and they're called black gold by gardeners because they're so useful. And composting problems. Oh, this is an interesting one. Do you have foul odors, green sludge, slow decomposition, the pile doesn't heat up, or fruit flies in your house. What's wrong with my compost? Compost acts on a carbon brown stuff to nitrogen green stuff ratio. So ideally, this should be 30 to 1 or 30% carbon, 1% nitrogen green stuff. And smelly or green sludge means you're adding too much greens at once. And some brown, add some brown leaves, shredded paper, or other drier material and turn it into your compost to help it out. If your high pile doesn't heat up or has very slow decomposition, you have too much carbon, the brown stuff in the pile. Add some green stuff. Fruit flies? Well, you're adding something you shouldn't be adding, something like meat or things like that. Or that you're adding things that are have grease or things like that. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can go in, people throw in their compost that should not be thrown in their compost. And preventing further problems, um, aerate the pile regularly. Increase uh, the porosity by adding something larger. So don't throw all tiny stuff, don't throw all big stuff, have different size stuff thrown in. And add things like shredded paper, brown leaves, and until it starts to look a big bit dry on top. And if you have big chunky stuff, chop them up before you throw in. So if you've got a whole broccoli stem, it's going to take a couple of years to break down unless you chop it up a bit. Corn cobs take forever. Yeah. <laughs> or you could put them on display because <laughs> they'll never break down. Uh, you can turn compost into the soil by digging or just lay it on top of the soil as a mulch and let the earthworms till it under for you. You apply it, compost will work wonders for your soil. And you can also, an easy fall soil recipe to grow vegetables next year, you just chop up your healthy plants from the vegetable garden, throw them with chopped leaves, leftover mulch, compost, spread it all over evenly on the garden, top dress it with some well-rotted manure, and leave the earthworms and other critters to do the work. Right. And seed starting. Geez, we're running late. We're already at 20 to 9. Anytime you have to leave, Ingrid, just let me know. We're going to get through this. I'm going to hang in till the end. Geez. You may have seen seed starting timesheets that show you when to start seeds. A better guide is the back of the seed package that will let you know how many days or weeks to start before the last frost. Packet will tell you how to grow your veg results. And it'll tell you whether the seed is hybrid, pollinated, nick, meaning grown with no pesticides, whether it's determinate or indeterminate. Remember those tomatoes, whether they're tall or whether they're short, whether they have a specific time frame they fruit in, or whether they are uh, continue to produce. Well, in the case of a tomato, it is a fruit. And heirloom, it'll tell you whether it's an heirloom variety, which means you can collect your own seed from the, uh, at the end of the season. 
gives you a lot of information plant at how far apart the plants should be, the care of the growing plant, and whether the seed needs any special treatment before it will germinate. And the seed packet itself usually gets ripped or dirty when you plant the seeds. So take a picture of the seed package or copy it on your photocopier so you don't lose the information once you get, get dirty hands and it gets all mushed up and you lose the information completely. And well, some, I've go ahead. Open, I've ripped them open and then realized afterwards that I haven't read the details underneath it and regretted it but you just know. take your cell phone take a picture before you open it. <coughs> excuse me <coughs> now some vegetable seeds that are easy to start indoors are beans broccoli brussels sprouts tomatoes cabbage leeks lettuce and peppers and all can be transplanted out when the risk of frost has passed you sow your vegetable seed directly outdoors. Make sure the soil temperature on the package matches the soil temperature outside. Cold, wet soil isn't the best place for seeds to germinate. And some seeds can be planted directly into the soil. Uh, beans, carrots, chives, lettuce, peas, and radishes. Now, beans do need warmer temperatures. You still have to look at what temperature they need to germinate at but you can plant them directly in the soil. And there are many resources on vegetable gardening out there on the web and in videos, and here are just a few of them. Um, when you're watching this video again, you can pause it and look at them, and because we are in a rush tonight, because we are over time, and we hope this inspires you to get started on growing your own vegetables. And if you have any questions after the webinar is finished, since we didn't have any during the webinar, because I'm just going to double check, we didn't get any questions. So we hope our Facebook pages and ask us some questions. For Northern Ontario, please visit our Facebook page, the Cochrane District Master Gardeners, and ask us a question. We're here to answer them. And if you live in Southern Ontario, please ask a question on the Durham Master Gardeners Facebook page. Both groups are available all year long to answer your questions on gardening. If you're inspired enough that you are interested in becoming a Master Gardener in Ontario, please visit magoi.ca. That's M-G-O-I dot C-A for more information. And I would like to thank Ingrid Jansen for co-hosting this webinar and thank you, the viewer, for joining us tonight. Bye for now and watch for our next webinar to be held next month. We'll be posting the dates and what the uh, webinar will be about. We're not quite sure who the co-host will be, so it's going to be a surprise. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good night and have a great weekend.